Hallelujah. Praise God. It's good to be in the Lord's house tonight. Amen. I'm glad you're here tonight and we need to be in prayer for those that is unable to be with us. Uh, that God be with them wherever they may be as well. Pray that they are well in that. I feel like God spoke to my heart yesterday morning. I got up and began to pray and read the Word and spent time in the Word. And I, I just was praying for yes for this morning service. Actually, yesterday praying for this morning service. I I take them one at a time, and I was praying, God, you begin to work. Well, when I got up this morning, God moved me in a different direction uh, than what I had anticipated to go, uh, and I felt like we needed to preach what we're going to preach tonight uh, in this manner. So turn with me to Hebrews tonight. Hebrews chapter number 2, and uh, I want to just do my best to be obedient to the Spirit of the Lord. I can't do anything without Him, and I learned that so long time ago, and may I never forget that either. Praise God. Can't do anything without Him. Let's begin reading in Hebrews 10 and verse number... Uh, let's begin reading here in verse number 10. Hebrews 2 and 10. And it says, And for it became him whom are, whom are all things, and by whom are all things, in, in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. For both he that sanctifieth and they who are sanctified are all of one, for which cause, it, which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren, saying, I will declare thy name unto my brethren, in the midst of the church will I sing praises unto thee. And again I'll put my trust in him. And again, behold, I and the children which God hath given me. For as much then as the children are partakers of flesh and blood, he also himself likewise took on the same, that through death that he might destroy him that had the power over death, and that is the devil. Would you pray with me tonight? Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this time that we have to come together tonight in your house. I pray, God, that you would anoint us tonight to preach your gospel. I pray, Lord, for the power of the Holy Ghost tonight to come down among your people, Lord, and move in our lives once again. God, we glorify you and we magnify you with everything that we have in us. I pray, God, that everything that we've done and will do from this point forward tonight. Bring glory and honor to your name. Asking these blessings tonight in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen and amen. You may be seated tonight. How many of you will agree that great things happen around the house of God? Amen. amen. Verse number 12 says saying I will declare thy name unto my, unto my brethren in the midst of the church. Now I want you to notice that. That was, as I read that yesterday, that just jumped off the page to me. In the midst of the church will I sing praises unto thee. We find there that the people of God worship when they come to the house of the Lord. Ladies and gentlemen, that is what this is about. God ordained for you and I that we have prayer, praise, and worship in the house of God. Those are ingredients for a move of the Spirit of God. And when we get away from that, then we don't have that. All right? But I believe that if for a person to ever be moving, then they must go forward in the things of God. We preached this morning about the breaking up of the deep. And though, though there's some great truths to that. And I believe that before a person can ever get into that relationship with God where they need to be, they must be broken up. They must be broken. That clay with all of its impurities, before it can be ever become a vessel, it has to be dug out of that ground. 
It has to be dislodged. It has to be taken apart. The impurities, the gravel, the little rocks, the things in there that are not needful for the vessel. On that potter's wheel, they'll be rolled out. Let me tell you something, friend. When the clay gets put on the vessel of the potter's wheel, if that clay's going to be used by that potter, it will be molded. I want you to know something tonight. For the men and women of God, if they ever going to be used by God, they are going to be molded into his image. Amen? They are going to be pressed beyond measure to be more like him than anything else. That vessel may be unique. It may be different in size. It may be different in shape. But the clay came from the same place and it was molded to be made into that image at the hand of that potter. And friend, may we be like the clay that's placed on the potter's wheel being yielded and molded and made into the image of Christ. Amen. I was reading that. They do in what Hebrews wrote. Here the writer of Hebrews wrote to you and I in verse 12. And he said, and they sang praises in the church. Amen. Friend, may the world know that when we get to church that they're going to be praising Jehovah. May the world say about the church of Jasper First Assembly of God. I know that when I get down there, they will be worship. I know that there will be praise. I know that there will be glory and honor to the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. The writer wrote to us here and he said, in the midst of the church, will I sing praises unto the Lord. Amen. My mind immediately went back to the book of Acts. Amen. When Jesus commanded his his disciples. He said, I want you to go into the city of Jerusalem and I want you to tarry there and then wait there. The Bible said that they went into an upper room and they waited for the promise of the Father. Amen. The Bible said they waited now for what God was going to do in their hearts and in their lives. And I begin to read that. I begin to think about that. Why did God say an upper room. Why did he tell them go up there? Can I just say to you they made a decision in their life. They made a, they made a decision there now to go on the word of Christ. They're putting faith now. Mixing what they believe with faith. They went and they tarried and they waited. Now ladies and gentlemen that was not an easy thing. And if you think that it was let me ask you something. How long has it been since you prayed for a long extended period of time but they waited for God and they prayed there amen what were they doing and I began to think about this yesterday as I was praying and meditating over the word of God I thought God what would our world be like today had they have not what would it be like tonight had they have not tarried there what would it be like to not have the blessings that we have but aren't you glad ladies and gentlemen they were hungry for the things of God and they were willing to make the climb amen they were willing to go forward with what God had for them he sent them to an upper room and they obeyed at the command of Christ it was still in their remembrance ladies and gentlemen what happened to John it was still in their remembrance what was there it was fresh on their mind here's a friend that had been with them that had been beheaded because he'd preached Christ. It was still fresh on their minds about Calvary. The Lord down the inside. There was a desire and a zeal that had not ever been there like before. They were willing to make the climb. They were willing to go a little higher in the things of God that the power of the Holy Ghost might move in their heart and in their life. They desired God more than anything in their heart could ever desire. They desired him in his fullness and in his glory. Hallelujah. And they were willing to make that climb to the top. I've been, there have been a lot of times in life and I've, and I've been in a lot of places and I've seen people sit down along the side. They want to see the side at the top but yet they're not willing to go forth to see it. 
my mind as I begin to go back through this. My mind began to go back to Exodus 33 and I began to went over there yesterday and I turned to begin to read about Moses. As Moses began to desire to have the presence of God in his life. Verse number 12 of Exodus 33 and he said, And Moses said unto the Lord, He said, See thou sayest unto me, He said, Bring up this people and thou hast not left me to know whom that thou would, wilt send with me. Yet thou hast said, I know thee by name and thou hast also found grace in my sight. Now therefore I pray thee if I have found grace in thy sight that he said show me now thy way. This was Moses that I may know thee that I may find grace in thy sight and consider that this nation is thy people. And he said my presence shall go with thee and I'll give thee rest. Amen. I can tell you his presence will bring rest in your life. The Bible said my presence shall go with thee and bring you rest. And he said unto him, he said if they have been, and for verse 16 said for wherein shall it be known here that I and thy people have found grace in thy sight and it is that thou goest with us so shall we be separated and I and thy people from all of the people that are upon the face of the earth and the Lord said to Moses I will do this thing also that thou hast spoken for thou hast found grace in my sight I know thee by name and he said I beseech thee this was Moses said I beseech thee, show me thy glory. Moses asked of God for his glory. Now, ladies and gentlemen, he didn't ask of him of a bank account. He didn't ask of him of more money or, or greater prestige or to be found greater. He didn't ask him of these things, although God blessed him. He didn't ask him of that. But he asked God for his glory. Now, I want you to know something. When you get to that point, you're a person that's hungry now for something out of the abnormal. That's something different there. Moses said, God, show me your glory. He didn't say, God, move me me down the road and show me your glory but he said God show me thy glory and God said to Moses he said this is what I will do he said I'll hide thee in what in the cliff of the rock he said Moses I will put you there and my glory shall pass by you're going to be allowed to see the hinder parts or the back side of the glory of God and that's the way that I'm going to do it but the Bible said that his hand shadowed Moses as the glory passed by. But I begin to think about that. God said, Moses, you're a man that I've called to do these things, but I will show you my glory, but I'm going to put you in the cliff of the rock. Ladies and gentlemen, you don't get up in the cliff of the rock without a climb. That's right. Moses got to that place where God would glory would come into his life because he desired it with every fiber of his being. He worked after the things of God with every everything about him. It isn't by works. The Bible said, lest any man should boast. But Moses positioned himself, himself where God could bless him. Moses put himself to the place that he desired God's glory in his life. I can tell you when we get hungry for that. God's glory will move in our heart and in our life. I begin to read down through this in Exodus. In verse 17, he asked him a very specific thing, and he said, and he said, I beseech thee, show me thy glory. I beg you, show me thy glory. He said, I'll make my goodness to pass before thee, and I'll proclaim thy name for the Lord before thee, and I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious, and I'll show mercy unto whom I'll show mercy. And he said, Thou camest not, thou canst not see me, my face, for there shall no man see me and live. God told Moses, You're not going to be able to see my face and live. But Moses desired to see it. He said in verse 21 of this chapter, and he said, and the Lord said, behold, there is a place by me and thou shalt stand upon a rock. God gave Moses the direction and he also gave him the place. 
that he's to stand. Can I just say to you tonight that the, the, when the disciples of old entered into the upper room, God was giving them a place to go and he was giving them something to stand upon. He was giving them the doctrine of Christ that they were to stand upon. He said, go you there and wait, tarry and wait upon the promise of the Father. He's going to send this. He's going to send you a comforter. He's going to send one back to you that's going to work in your life. Friend, if ever there was a nation that needs this right now, it's the nation in which you and I live. If ever there was a nation that needs churches again full of the power of the Holy Ghost, it's the nation in which you and I live. Amen. May God stir us again. May God break up the deep things that's on the inside of us. Paul told young Timothy, he said, do what with the gifts of God? Stir them up, Timothy. Stir up the gift of God that's within you. I begin to study that this morning about, about the breaking up, and I keep going back there for whatever, but the, but the breaking up scholars said that in that era of time before Genesis 7, possibly the highest mountains that there were were 10,000 feet. Possibly that was as high, but when it began to break up, the great canyons that we have were formed in that formation at that period of time from the force of water at that hour. I begin to think, oh God, what a beautiful place that you formed when things begin to transpire, ladies and gentlemen, from that. But when it comes to our life, if we will allow God to break up the fallow ground that's there, then the glory of the Lord can spring forth out of our hearts and out of our lives. But not until... You know, this is springtime, and everybody, probably everybody in here, you raised, you either do raise a garden or have raised a garden. And you know, I, and, and I love to watch this. Of course, I've grown up with it all my life. And, and uh, on the hill there where we lived, you would have done had your potatoes planted uh, a few years ago when my family, my grandparents was alive. And, and uh, I can remember that very vividly. And needless to say, I hated to see potato planting time. And there was a reason that I hated it. Because 4th of July, there'd be time to pick them up. That's why I hated to see them planted. But you realize something? It was provisioning for days ahead. They come in pretty handy. They come in pretty handy along through the year. But I sure did hate to see them planted when I was a kid because there would be a day that they would have to be picked up. A lot of kids went to the creek and all these things, swimming pools and that sort of things. Not us. We'd go to the potato patch and you could mark it down the fourth or the fifth every year. And they didn't pick up a few of them. My goodness, they'd plant them by the tow sack full and pick them up by the truck full. Had to have a bunch. But it was provisioning. It's for a time not right then, but it was a time down the road. It was for a time that was coming. Ladies and gentlemen, we need to plant today in an abundance, expecting a harvest. Yes. Sowing in the things of God, not talking about gardening now, but sowing in the things of God, expecting a harvest. You don't go out here and throw a little seed out and say, well, we'll get a, we'll get a big deal out of this. No, you put that seed there and that seed has preparation. You realize that. You can go out out there, you go down here to the feed store, buy the best seed that they got, take it out there to ground that's not prepared for it, and it ain't going to yield you nothing to the potential that it has. But when the ground's prepared and the ground's been broken up, you see, before that ground can ever take that seed, what does it first have to be done? It has to be broken up. Anybody knows anything about ground breaking? You do know this, that when the, when the farmer comes in, the garden folks come in, there's a thing that they do. They turn that ground over 
and then they will till that ground and they will break that ground. I've watched that process when there was no tractor, okay? I've watched that process when there was just an old black mule that walked up and down that garden. I've sat underneath the pecan tree there and I've watched that. I've watched my grandpa where there wouldn't be a dry thread nowhere on him. I've seen my grandmother bring him water out there, drink with a dipper in that, in that garden as he would walk up and down that field hour after hour what seemed like to turn that garden over but it was for a purpose church it was for something not then but it was for a harvest that was to come it was for a time of planning that there one day would be a reaping I can tell you prayer ain't always easy but I can tell you prayer moves the heart of God toward a people that's hungry and thirsty for the glory of God to come down. Oh, it's good when it's there. But friend, you never come to a revival that hasn't first been anointed and prayed through and the glory of God come down on it. A lot of people come in and sit down and enjoy the goods of it. But somebody paid the price in the altar of prayer to reap the reward of the glory of God. Make our mind up. What are we going to do? Will we be the one that chooses to pay the price or will we be the one that just feasts on the good vine? Somebody has got to pay the price. Somebody's got to be the one that'll say, Lord, I'll go if nobody else does. I'll be the one that will break this up, that God may move. Moses was moved to the place where he could, where in the cliff of the rock, and God's glory was there. But you realize something. Moses was willing to climb that. You see that? Moses was willing to be put to where God could move in his heart and in his life. There's a lot of people that they talk about wanting God. They talk about wanting what God has for them, being in the blessings of God, having the favor of God, but when it comes down to that point of getting into that place, they didn't want that near so bad. They didn't want that near as bad as they thought that they did. I was about 10 or 11 years old, something like that. We was hauling hay in one of the bottoms and Back there at that time, there's a guy flying over and a little old bitty hang glider deal had a motor on it. I'm about the only one of them. I've seen maybe one or two since then, but fly through there. And there's a guy told my dad, we was in that bottom hauling hay, and he told my dad, he said, I want to ride that thing with that boy. Dad said, you'll be down here in a little while. And he said, I'm going to ride that. He circled and circled where we was in that hayfield hauling square bells and a little while he flew in there and lit. When he flew in there and lit, Dad hollered at him and said, Hey, said, he's wanting to ride with you. He said, No, 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 no. He said, I've changed my mind. You know, it looked good at a distance, but when it got down to it, he said, well, we can do it. We can take it back up there. And he had two seats on it. But he changed his mind, see, when it got down time to it. You see, there's a lot of people that they talk about it. And they've got good intentions. But when it comes down to it, no, no, I've changed my mind. I can tell you, ladies and gentlemen, to ever have the power of God in your life, to ever have the power of the Holy Ghost moving in your life, you're going to have your mind made up that this is what what I want. Amen. That this is what I desire. That this is what I came for. That this is where the glory of the Lord is. That I can have the power and the might of his resurrection reigning and moving in my heart and in my life. Amen. You won't be able to be talked out of it. You'll not be able, when you sure enough get hungry for it, you'll not be able to be talked out of it because you desire it. In Acts chapter 1, let's turn there tonight. I want to read us just a little bit of this if we can tonight. And forgive me, tonight I, I'm struggling uh, with, with these glasses that I've got on. They're about half the strength that I need. And uh, I've picked them up a time or two in the last few weeks and got down here with them. 
I just generally don't like to throw them away because I might need them in a desperation. But right now I'm needing another pair pretty bad. Acts 1 and 1 said, For the former treaties have I made to the O Theopolis, Theolopus, for all that Jesus began both to do and teach. He said, Until the day in which that he was taken up, after that that through the Holy Ghost had given commandment unto the apostles for whom that he had chosen, for to whom also he showed himself alive, that after his passion by many infallible proofs, being seen of them forty days and speaking of the things pertaining unto the kingdom of God and being assembled together with them. Now listen to this. He commanded them that they should not depart from Jerusalem but wait for the promise of the Father which, say, which, he, which saith he ye have heard of me. Now ladies and gentlemen he told them not to depart but wait. He said don't leave here guys but wait. Something's going to happen. Now, now friend, if, if, if you would have told people that in this day, they'd have said, we ain't got time to wait. <laughs> we need it now. We're going to throw wave. We need it now. We need just this real quick thing. But he said I want you to not leave here but wait. What did they do? They tarried and waited until God moved in there like he had never moved before. Folks, I'd never thought about what the consequences could be like tonight had not he poured the power of his spirit out upon this group of people. They were willing to make the sacrifice that you and I could have the blessings that we have in this era of time that we've lived. They were willing to pray until God's glory came in their midst. Ladies and gentlemen, it wasn't no easier for them than it is for me or you. It might have been a little harder. Like I said a minute ago, they had already saw John beheaded and Jesus crucified, but what were they having? They were still going to have a prayer meeting and wait for something that God says coming. Yes. Amen. Amen. They'd done seen Christ crucified. They'd done saw how angry that they'd got, but they also saw him risen. Amen. I said they'd also saw him risen from the dead. They'd also saw his side that had been pierced and his hands and feet that had been nailed through. And friend of mine, they were desirous to have his promise they were desirous to have what he had said you can have he said now gentlemen I want you to wait for it it's coming your way and they tarried there and prayed and the place where they were sitting the Bible said a sound of a mighty rushing wind filled that house now think about this the Bible said the sound of it filled that house the rushing mighty wind blew in there and it was noised there was nobody he had to stand up and say, now listen guys, the Spirit of the Lord's here. Hey, what nobody had to stand up and say, everybody, you be sensitive, God's here. No, sir. The Bible said of a sound of a mighty rushing wind, they knew something's here. Something's different here. And friend, it could have happened anywhere, but where did it happen? It happened in an upper room where they had gathered and assembled themselves together and God began to move. He could have moved on every one of them individually, but when they come together and they unified themselves, they become in one mind and one accord and they got down to business with God and his glory began to flow through them. Amen. And they've tried ever since, the devil's tried ever since to put a stop to it. But friend, he ain't stopped it and he ain't gonna stop it either because he's fighting against something that he cannot win. Hey man, he's fighting. He is a, a defeated foe that's fighting hard. That's just about all you can say about it. He's trying to win, but he ain't going to win that fight for it's been settled in heaven. Hey Amen. It's been settled in heaven. He's fought against the church since the church was established. He's fought against believers since there's been the very first one. He's fought against it since he was cast out of the out of heaven himself. But friend, I can tell you something. He'll continue to fight. He'll continue to strive. He'll continue to pull people in his direction and that he's done and will do. And there's going to be multitudes of 
of millions that's going to fall after his way. But I can tell you there is still a remnant. Yes, hallelujah. And I believe that when a remnant comes together, they are to praise God. They are to worship God. They are to glorify Him, magnify Him. Listen to what it says in Leviticus tonight, Leviticus 26 and 11. It says, And I'll set my tabernacle among you. My soul shall not arbor you. I'll walk among you, and I'll be your God, and you shall be my people. I can tell you God desires to walk among us. God desires to stir in our heart and in our life and have fellowship with you and I that he might be glorified through our hearts and through our lives and in our walk in our relationship with him every day that we live. And I can tell you this, it will be a struggle. It'll be a fight. You're going to live for God. You just as well as to make your mind up to it. There's going to be a battle in this walk of living for God. And when you begin to get close to Him, <clears throat> don't expect anything but that. Right. And then don't get to thinking you've got to figure out what area it's going to come to because there's going to be a place, there's going to be a direction it's going to come from. It's going to blindside you just shores the world. But you can expect to an enemy to attack. Now, it's not of man, although the devil may use people. But who lies behind that? The devil does. If he can stop you and I from praying, he can stop you and I from worship, he can stop you and I from reading the word of God and glorifying the word of God, his job just got a whole lot easier. Yes, it did. He's, got, he's a lot less worried about you and I when he's got those, those components in our life slowed down or stopped or inactive. But when you get somebody active, he notices that. And he's, whoo, they've been praying today. They've prayed through. I can tell you, the devil knows when you get prayed through most of the time before you do. <laughs> he comes by to get things stirred up, get something going wrong. Oh yeah. He gets our minds out here on everything in the world besides what we've come in to do. You, and you know, you think that's strange? It's not strange when you come to the house of the Lord. Something went going through your mind that you couldn't, you cannot believe that it's there. Let me ask you something. How long did it go through your mind after you went home? Yeah. About the time you laid down that recliner, was that still going through your mind? Probably not. But you see, the enemy kept people's minds. Well, this is going on, and that's going on, and this has happened. And Lord, I, I tr you, you try, but listen, ladies and gentlemen, what's the Bible say about that? Resist him. You see, that's who's behind all that. It's the enemy that's putting that out there to get your mind preoccupied with, with, with whatever. Whatever may be happening. It may be something at the house or something at the farm or something here or there, whatever. But the enemy placed that out there to keep you from getting into that atmosphere of where God's glory is moving through. I'm one of these type of individuals that I try my best to not let anything bother me. I, I do. I try. I try that. Uh, but and I try it at night time when I come in. Most of the time, 97, 8 percent of the time, when I come into the house and it gets, it, this time of the year it's usually dark, near, or any time of the year it's usually dark. But when I come in and sit down in that chair and eat supper and get ready to get ready to go to bed, I can most of the time I go to bed and I am asleep within three minutes after I go to bed or less. And I won't wake up most of the time. I'll not be awake till it's time for that alarm clock to go off and to get up and start that day all over again. But once in a while, I'll come in and, and get try to get, but I've got my mind running and my mind's just going 90 to nothing. And you've been there. Yeah. And I'm one of these, if I've got something that's really pressing hard on that job or at that farm or whatever, it will preoccupy me 
sometimes to the point that I don't sleep an hour during the whole night because I just sit there and run that through my mind and try to fix it. I would be better up getting up going working on it than I would be laying there thinking about it. And I ain't doing anything but just being extremely tired. But what's the devil do with us? He preoccupies our mind to keep our mind off of Christ. With everything that there is out there, he bombards us. Why is that? So that you don't get close to him. Because he knows that when you get close to him, great things happen in the lives of believers. Great things happen around believers. You know, I've listened and been so privileged in the course of time to be around people and hear testimonies of great things of what God has done in the lives of individuals. That's not by coincidence. But I can tell you where that's at. It's when people dare to believe God in His fullest. They dare to believe God above circumstance, above situation, above problem, above all else. They dare to believe God. And I can tell you that's the place that miracles are made. It's when people step out and say, I'm just going to trust God. I'm just going to trust God. And I've had people to tell me, well, sir, or brother Steve... I have given it to the Lord. I had a great friend who's gone home to be with Jesus. And I'm so looking to spend eternity with him. We were, we become very close. Didn't know him too awful long, probably less than 10 years, but I became very close to him and just, just thought the world of him. He called me one day and I can take you to the place that I sat in. He took treatments and been through all sorts of treatments. And I was sitting there on the phone visiting with him. And he said, Steve, I've made the decision to not do anything else. My family doesn't agree with it. They're, they're upset with me about it. My kids is, it doesn't agree with it. But he said, I'm going to do this because he said, I'm going to trust God. And if God sees me through, God sees me through. But if God don't, then God will take me home. I wanted to say, are you sure about this? But you see, that wasn't my place. That was his. And I told him, I said, buddy, I'll pray with you whatever your decisions is. And he chose that. And I can tell you this, ladies and gentlemen, when we choose to trust God, we're setting ourselves up for a place that God will work in our hearts and in our lives and where miracles are made. You realize that? When we realize that I'm going to trust God with everything I've got in me, God can use and does use doctors and all these things. He does that. He uses them. But when we put our faith in Him above, of everything else we're saying to the Lord I'm putting my trust in you above all and I want to follow on with you Jesus we have to believe that God's able and when we do God moves us to a level in him that we come sink or swim we're going to stay with you Jesus we're going to stay with you Jesus and I can tell you this that sometimes is hard but we move, Moses was willing to make the climb to come into the presence of God. Moses was willing to go forward with God. And he went up and God began to move there in that cliff. What happened? God came by where he was. What did Moses say? I desire to see you, Lord. I desire to see the presence of God. Let me ask each one of us something tonight, and I'm done right here. Let me ask you something tonight. Do you desire to see God? I know, I know what our minds just said. Oh, when I get there, I will. Yes, you will when we get there. 
But do you desire to see the presence of God? Think about that with me. Do you desire that here? In that room, in that upper room, the disciples, as they were praying, God poured out His Spirit and it moved in there mightier than they'd ever saw. There's a lot of people that don't desire to see that because they're afraid of what could happen in their life. And I've dealt with that. I've dealt with people that are fearful to get close to God because of they're afraid of what might happen in their life. What it boils down to is they want God, but they don't want all of it. They want a little bit. They're afraid of what God might ask them to do. They're afraid of a trial that might come their way. They're afraid of a circumstance that might happen to them. But do you really want to see Him? Do you really want to see God in His fullness and in His glory and in His power and in His might? Moses said, God, that's what I want from you. God said, you can have it. You can have it. It's going to come, but you're going to be in that cliff and that rock when I come by. And he said, Moses, and the reason, why did God shield Moses? Because of the strongness of the presence of God. For the Bible tells you that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God. There's a reason that God shielded Moses. Mortally, Moses could not handle the presence of God. But God shielded him in the cleft of the rock. And when the presence of the Lord passed by, Moses, looking out of that crack, or however it was, saw the glory of God go by. And Moses was changed. The Bible said that his face glowed to the place that they covered his face yes. when he came back to the camp. He didn't have a, a t-shirt on that said, I've been in the cliff of the rock. But it was showing on his face that I've been in the presence of God. When they come out of the upper room, they didn't have t-shirts made that said, I've been in the upper room. No, no. It was noised abroad. And the Bible said that they said, these men are not drunk as you suppose, but it's but the third hour of the day. They begin to speak in unknown tongues as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. They begin to move as the Spirit of God gave them the utterance. They begin to walk after the things of God as God began to move. And look what happened in our world today. God began to move in their heart and in their life. And we've been blessed because of it. Yeah. Would you bow your heads with us tonight? Musicians, would you come back and help me tonight in this part of the service? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I've climbed just a little higher in this thing. That ought to be the desire of the heart of men and women of God. We all like mountaintops, every one of us does. Being raised in mountains as we have here, we all realize ever get up to that top of that mountain, there'll always be a climb. Sometimes it's a climb that it's a lonely road. There's times that I've sat down as I've been as low to the valley as you could go. But I know that to get back to where I needed to be, I had to go to top. Now, friend, there have been times that I'd walk in the valley so long that when I'd start to climb, I'd think, God... I'll never get to that truck. I'll never make it to the top. I'd go along and been in places it'd be so steep that I'd hold to the bushes to pull myself up. 
I'd stick my foot behind a rock or behind a little old bush and stand there and just rest. But a note that I had to go on. Had to go on. Had to push on forward. Because I wasn't to the top yet. I wasn't to the top yet. Sometimes God gets us out of that comfortable place that we're in. He takes that old clay vessel and puts it back on the potter's wheel. To mold it. And I'm going to tell you something. When God puts you on the wheel, He puts you on that wheel for a purpose. To mold you and me like He wants us to be. We're just climbing just one more rung up the ladder. Just making the climb tonight. But we're headed somewhere. Where you headed, preacher? We headed to the mountain. We're headed to the mountain. What's there? This way what God has for me. I stop what God has for me. For you. I wonder tonight sitting across this house if there be anybody here lost and undone without Christ. And one day tonight He said, among this body of believers, sin, Lord, I just need to be saved. I want you to get up out of your seat tonight where you're seated at and make your way down to this altar. We want to pray with you. We want to pray with you.